know, it's, it's required that I um, stumble on the down arrow and the space bar for a while, and then I'll go ahead and start. Uh, so I uh, want to th uh, thank the, uh, the group that, that uh, worked with here, uh, Mike Gaziano, uh, Stephen Kingsmore, Aaron Ramos, and, and uh, myself, uh, around, around this, these issues of, see if I could have had to go back, uh, in issues of, of um, the, the, work, the electronic medical record workflow, uh, the, the issues around transportability, uh, the uh, interaction with databases and that, that sort of topics. Um, also, I uh, shamelessly stole Carol's uh, slide format, literally used her slide format that she had sent out, and so uh, I, hopefully I have changed enough words, Carol, where it won't look exactly like yours, but anyway, I, I thought I would, I would make that, uh, uh, that, that plug before, before you got me later. Uh, there, in, in terms of the, the importance and impact of, of what we're trying to look at, the, the quantity of data that's being generated for each patient has just made it so that uh, medicine can't be practiced the way it, it, it used to be. And, and it's still quite remarkable interacting with, with colleagues, even in the academic setting, how much they still want to have the, uh, th that format. Um, there, there's still quite a few folks, mainly older than me, that have uh, cards in their pocket or have their, their, um, their, I, their, their iPhone app that they call their peripheral brain that really is not very much of a brain. Uh, it's more just a list of, of things and a acronyms and such. Um, and so there's, there's an opportunity to take advantage of of, uh, of uh, the, the informatic space that really is not happening now, but there's also a necessity that, that's there that just wasn't there before. Uh, the, the complexities are, are also not just in one part of it. There's complexities in the generation of genomic data, the annotation of it, the interpretation, the implementation, the application, probably other shuns that I didn't put in there, but the, the, the idea that, that we can just do it uh, um, and it, it's simple is, is, not, is not there. There's still a lot to be, to be learned. And this is especially true uh, when, when thinking about uh, our, our electronic health record, electronic medical record, whatever you uh, like to call it, which was principally built as a, a billing uh, tool uh, that has now been morphed somewhat into a, a clinical management tool. And, and yes, there are centers that built their EHR um, as a, a clinical management tool, but most of the commercial available uh, 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 products started as a, a billing tool that is now being morphed, and we have all the pains that come with uh, something that is not purpose-built uh, and, and such. Um, there's also a need for, for uh, bi-directional sharing of genomic information, um, not only the uh, taking data from ClinVar or other sources in terms of, of interpreting a, a readout for an individual patient at the clinical level, but also being able to put that data back into uh, databases in, in order to then benefit from that, that new Bayesian uh, type strategy. Um, and then the, the point I jumped over is that patients, the way clinical care is delivered now, uh, they're, they're seeing a number of different uh, clinicians, certainly in our area, not only do they see a number of different clinicians, their neurologists, their cardiologists, their oncologists, but they might have one up in Ohio as well uh, that they, they uh, see ha spend half the year or as little time as they can uh, to, uh, before they come back down to Florida. You know, so there, there's some complexities there that, that really make this important. And then, of course, there's the, the data information knowledge wisdom uh, 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 paradigm um, in which we, we currently spend a lot of our time around data, um, some around information, very little around knowledge, and then we have no wisdom. So the, the idea that we need to try to build in uh, approaches to, to tackle that is, is, is part of this. Now, let's see, I hit the wrong button there. Uh, um, Mike uh, gave a, a couple of slides around the VA program, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll talk through them, and then he can, at the end, correct everything that I said. Uh, but the reason for showing these slides was just to try to illustrate the complexity of data uh, that is in, in, his, uh, in his system. And I think most of us, or many of us, uh, use the, the, uh, the VA electronic health record as our example of, of um, how it should be. Um, and Mike, uh, certainly on the calls, it was, was very quick to point out that, first of all, it's not a electronic uh, health record. Uh, secondly, even within one site, it's a conglomeration of, of health records. And so our, our gold standard, uh, I don't know what he would call it, but maybe it's a bronze standard uh, that, that we, we have in terms of, of uh, what we're shooting for, and we need to, uh, need, need to learn from that and work forward. But here, here's um, showing just some complexities of, of, uh, 
of, of how, for an individual participant, there might be survey results, clinical results, non-VA clinical results from CMS, et cetera, biospecimen molecular data that comes with that, um, all sorts of data within the, the surveys and the other data, the National Health Death Index, uh, CMS data, um, and then, of course, I'm not sure how well that shows up, uh, but what one, just the, the amount of data is, is really um, quite large in terms of how it goes in. Looks like this slide got squished a little bit when I put it in here. Um, but we, we, there's a, a, a quite a complexity in terms of within the data warehouse and then, of course, across the different processes. And so as we're thinking about clinical flow and, and the issues, it, there, there is a, a high level of complexity just in the structure of, of the way the data will flow, much less in terms of, of the analytics and, and such that are implemented on, on that structure. And we'll, we'll uh, come back to that in a second. There are related programs that are, are uh, playing in this space, certainly within NHGRI. Uh, the, the Emerge Network is, is a key one, um, and we'll talk a, a little bit more about that. Uh, CSER has, has some activity in this space, uh, or a lot of good activity in this space. Uh, ClinGen has a, a, a lot of activity there. Um, I, I, and so from, these are NH, uh, uh, NHGRI uh, programs, and there are probably more that I didn't put in there. And then, of course, uh, at the, NA, at the uh, uh, NIH and broadly, uh, NCBI is active here, and, and other the institutes have activity within uh, the the informatic infrastructure. The the barriers uh, I listed some of the barriers, and we'll have more of them that come up during the discussion. Uh, but but one of them is that the curation of the of the data uh, really. It's, it's unique within each of the EHRs. There, it's, it's not like uh, we can uh, have an analytical tool that will work at, at EPIC in, in, uh, in one site, and then it will work in EPIC at, a, at another site. So even within a given EHR, there's a lot of variability. And so the idea that one can, can um, build some algorithms and quickly implement them is, is, not, uh, is, is not always true. And we'll, we'll come to a slide about that in a second. Um, Emerge is making progress in that, and, and, but there, there's still a lot to do. Uh, many of the EHR elements are not biologically driven constructs, and, and this came out of some of the discussion on our phone call. Uh, one of the examples that, that Mike gave was around uh, cancer and, and how uh, cancer is moving away from an anatomical uh, basis to much more of a molecular similarity. And so before, one would identify that it's a breast cancer and then identify that there was estrogen receptor uh, uh, expressed in it and then would uh, use a, a hormone uh, therapy of some sort, aromatase inhibitor or, or a, a, a uh, serum uh, like tamoxifen to, to uh, block that estrogen receptor. And one still does that, except one now, especially in advanced disease, looks more broadly. And, and certainly we have uh, thyroid cancers and renal cancers that are being treated with the same drug, um, even though they're, they're quite distinct in terms of histology as, as well as anatomy. And, and so our EHRs are built under a, the, the anatomical paradigm uh, are not necessarily as easily uh, useful uh, for the way, uh, way patients are now being treated. There is there's also very few practical analytics to aid the use of EHR data. And, and we, we, this came up a little bit yesterday, but it is, it is not trivial to, to um, develop an app and stick it on the EHR. I mean, we, those of us who don't do that for a living talk about it quite trivially. It's, it's, well, just, you know, there's an app for that. We can just do that, right? Um, uh, but the, the actual implementation of it is, is quite challenging, and the robustness, and certainly if it's now something that we're using for clinical care or, or for uh, pa uh, patients uh, to, to use in their own uh, management of their life, um, is, is, uh, the, the, there's a robustness to it there. Um, and then also there's, there's uh, very little investment in mapping within electronic health records. And um, that is, is I, as a non-informaticist, uh, it is an extremely boring issue. It is something, you know, do I really want, you know, federal funds being spent on that? And yet it is critical if we're trying to make progress with this. So um, Mike uh, gave the example that across the VA system, there are, there are right around 3,000 variables that have the word albumin um, in, their, in their title. And so from, uh, some of those are, are uh, the measurement of albumin in, in, in serum. Some of those are albumin in, in another biologic fluid. Some of them are albumin that has been glycosylated or as some other feature has happened to it. Um, and there are some very distinct uses of each of those. Some of them are redundant. Some of them are, 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 are useful by themselves. Um, and the idea that, that those just are, are out there and can be easily used is, is just not true. 
There's also differences in the way clinical, clinical groups use um, ICD-9 codes, or soon to be ICD-10 codes, um, in that uh, there, there's a, a lot of the specialty groups that are very careful about their use of the codes. Uh, and and uh, I think uh, Mike, Mike mentioned a, an example around the use of some of the Alzheimer's codes, if I remember correctly, how within the neurology community, they're very precisely used, uh, but in the family medicine community, uh, they, as they went, went mapped back, the, those codes were really just reflecting dementia of some sort. Um, and so, you know, again, using the ICD-9 codes without cleaning uh, the data from a research standpoint is problematic. And then also, if we want now clinical decision support or other things to fire based on those, um, there's also that same uh, uh, mapping that needs to be uh, conducted. Now, there, there certainly are synergies within uh, some of the existing programs. It, I mean, Emerge is a natural one because it's, it's really doing a lot of things in this space. There's been great progress made. Many representatives are here um, on that. Um, for ClinGen also, there's some very nice uh, 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 links there, and I'll, I'll come back to that. I didn't put in a slide for Ignite, mainly because one wasn't easily available, uh, but I, it could have. Um, the Precision Medicine Initiative, um, you know, the beauty of an initiative that hasn't yet been uh, formally constructed is that it can do everything that we need. Um, and certainly, there's very few uh, problems that it is not going to be the answer to, according to this meeting. Um, so uh, I think as reality comes forward, as we decide, you know, what is the bite size uh, part of precision medicine as opposed to just shoving the whole thing in our mouth. Um, we're we're going to figure out that there will be some issues that we can solve, um, and then there will be others that we need other solutions for. And so that, you know, again, is, is to be, to be uh, determined. Now, within ClinGen, uh, some of the work on data flow is, is, uh, is, is certainly being worked on. Uh, it's relatively early days, but you have um, expert groups, other research projects uh, looking at, at ClinVar in, in terms of, of uh, variant level data, um, developing a, a ClinGen a knowledge base that is, is being curated by the expert groups, pulling in data from other sources, um, and then is, you get expert curation at the various um, levels and you know, the different working groups that are, that are out there. And certainly, uh, that model is, is a, a I, I, as, as a participant in this, I think that is a very successful model. Um, but it's a, it's a very challenging model in terms of scaling. And, and certainly, the amount of data that's there, the amount of effort that, that has to be put out, even to curate the, the easy areas. You know, pharmacogenomics to me is the easy area because there aren't that many genes, and there aren't that many drugs, and, there aren't that, um, and yet it's been very challenging, not only in terms of getting a consensus around what is actionable and what is not, uh, but also even the wording, you know, uh, pathogenic has very little meaning in the context of a drug uh, and the genes and drugs. And so we've had to come up, and one of the, the points of, of slowness has been working through um, some naming that, that can be, that will resonate at, in pathology labs and in clinical pharmacology suites and in the doctor's office as well as in informatically. And, and so, you know, even the simple things still would take a, a fair amount of work. Uh, the, the, um, the, the good news is that something like, like ClinVar has a, a large number of, of data, and the number of variants is, is growing. Um, I think ClinGen efforts will, will help uh, these, these efforts grow even further. Um, but, but certainly, there's a large amount of data coming in. Uh, there, there's a lot of, of different groups that are, that are putting this. This is just showing some of the groups, screenshot uh, from, from Heidi, and actually via Aaron, um, on uh, the, the large number of groups that are submitting data. Um, and, and, and then some of the folks that are, are working on the, the different ways of, of naming. You know, it, it, you know there's, as, as we dig down further, uh, we, we see a, a lot more new names coming out for describing uh, different phenotypes. Uh, sorry, Jonathan, for not drawing a beard on, on your picture there. But uh, anyway, I think people will still recognize you. Um, uh, but so, so there's a lot of effort that's trying to prepare uh, for the, the clinical flow, for the databases being, being useful in, in that model, uh, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and then this is just a reminder on the, from the eMERGE standpoint, um, this is showing there's a phenotype of interest and algorithm that can be developed and there's a manual review that can happen um, and uh, some, some uh, analytics around that in terms of, of uh, uh, positive, negative, predictive values. It can be deployed at, at one site. 
Um, the testing can happen, and then you get validation that happens in other sites. What, what's not shown in here is that these small little steps here that are, look so easy take a, a huge amount of work. And you know, Emerge is one of the few groups that have developed algorithms at one site and then worked with expert uh, collaborators at, at other sites to, to try to really make that happen. And so we have examples where uh, you know, Chris's team might have developed something when he was in Mayo, um, and it works great on the Mayo EHR. And then the hard work begins to make sure that those uh, analytics can also work in Marshfield or also can work at Vanderbilt. Um, and and you know, each of the sites have their own version of that. Um, and, and it's really been uh, illustrative of, of the hard work that has to happen. And right now, there are very few efforts outside of, of um, Emerge that are really focusing on this in terms of, of phenotyping for the types of diseases we're, we're thinking of. And so I think there's an opportunity to, to enhance that further. Sorry, skip over that. Uh, the, the other point we're, at, we're uh, supposed to uh, touch on was training opportunities. And, and really, there's not a lot of NIH focus right now on the training of electronic health records scientists in the way that we've been talking about it over these two days. There are programs for training uh, uh, com computational sciences, informaticists, in working with electronic health records. But they're, they're, the ones that I'm familiar with are, are, more, are very much focused on the, the, the structure, uh, um, looking at structural challenges, not as much on the analytics part of it. And that doesn't mean there's none. I, I, I said not a lot. There's not none. Um, and, but there, there really hasn't been an emphasis there. And, and partly because there, there's not a, a National Institute for Electronic Health Records. Um, and, and partly because the, the uh, NCBI and, and the others there um, that, that do work in this space have a lot of, of, of territory to cover. Um, but we're, we're seeing a little bit of activity in the universities uh, in terms of growing these programs. Um, not as much activity in the private sector yet, although they like to hire the people from the universities. Uh, but uh, there is an opportunity there from a training standpoint uh, for someone uh, to try to en enhance that. So I, I put a couple of, of points on here uh, that are, uh, and then we really want the discussion to, to flesh it out into, into more specifics. But one thing I want to make is that NHGRI should not, cannot, and does not need to solve all of electronic health record workflow and transportability issues. Now, they are in our way, but NHGRI is not the Electronic Health Record Institute. And the problem is that the problems that we're having, problem the whole field is having. And there's a, there's a temptation to come out of here and say, all right, we're going to have, uh, you know, we're going to recommend that, that this program be developed to, um, to solve the EHR. Um, it would take all the money the Institute has and uh, totally change the, 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 the focus. And it, it just, you know, in some ways that bullet point is just to make sure that you guys, that the uh, NHGRI uh, program staff know that it's, it's, it's not solely your responsibility to solve all these problems. Um, a lot of the tools that are designed uh, for billing, you know, most of the EHRs, are, are not going to meet all of our needs. And so I, I think some of the discussion yesterday really brought out that some of the solutions will be morphing the EHR, but some of the solutions are going to be extra uh, EHR. They're going to be something that's outside the EHR that interacts with it. And, and certainly within pathology right now, uh, within radiology, within a lot of the, the clinical tools, the, the, the metadata might be available in the EHR, but the, the absolute data, or whatever the right term is for that, um, is not. It's in a, it's in a different uh, place, um, partly because of the, the practicalities of size and such, and partly because of, the, uh, of the, the lack of need for that level of data. And so there might be some solutions there. I think the new Precision Medicine Initiative uh, will require these kinds of informatic workflows and analytics, and so uh, there, there are some opportunities to ride on that, uh, on that initiative in terms of creating some of these, uh, some of these issues. Um, and then the, the last little piece is that tr training is really not organized uh, on a national level. There, there is, is not a, a, a K23 or a K08 or, uh, or such focused around uh, bioinformatic uh, EHR analytics or in, things like that, at least not that I could find. Someone may correct me. Um, and so I think there's some, um, s some opportunities to, to develop there. So I'd like to, to stop at this point and ask um, Aaron and Stephen and, and Mike uh, to fill in the, the blanks, and then we can open up more broadly.
Thanks, Howard. Um, I just sort of had two points to reiterate what you um, already said and not really um, fill, any, fill in any gaps. But uh, I was glad to hear you say it wasn't our responsibility to solve the EHR uh, workflow. Solely. Not solely, solely right, responsibility. Right, solely. But so that made me think, what can we do to um, better engage and collaborate with the Office of um, Data Science and the BD2K program? I don't know if... Um, I know they recently had a call, for example, for um, administrative supplements looking at um, in promoting data interoperability, but I've, I don't know, I, and I'm really curious to know if any of that work is in the EHR space. Um, Eric, do you, do you know if they're doing anything in the EHR space? You know, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I was going to make a slightly different point. Do I want to make this now? Because in terms of where locus of expertise might sit in EHR. Um, and I was actually just looking up to give you a more precise time. So um, as many of you, one, one, one thing that is relevant at an NIH corporate level is that this area sort of has gotten attention, especially around Precision Medicine Initiative, and recognizing that this is one of these classic examples of an area that slips between the cracks of, of institutes and centers. It's yeah. not, you know, and um, so keeping that in mind and recognizing that it has been on many of our minds of late and certainly Genome Institute is not going to solve this problem. We are certainly interested and will help if we can, but this is much bigger than us. Um, some of you may um, recognize that um, Don Lindbergh, longstanding, many-year director of the National Library of Medicine, retired recently, and rather than immediately launch a new search, um, uh, and, and since um, uh, lots have changed, uh, many things have changed in this world. Um, uh, since the National Library of Medicine was created and even since the last time it had a director appointed. Um, uh, so Francis Collins appointed um, a working group of his highest level advisory group, the advisory committee to the director, um, to look at the NLM and to sort of rearticulate a contemporary vision for it going forward that could serve as a blueprint, if you will, for the new director. And I was asked along to co-chair that working group along with Harlan Krumholtz of Yale University. And if those who are interested, I was just looking up uh, because I wanted to make this point, at 11.15 on Thursday, the report of that working group is being presented to the advisory committee to the NIH director in what is an openly webcast, you know, live webcast, totally public uh, um, uh, uh, event. Um, the working group report will actually be posted at that time online for you to read. And, um, and a series of recommendations will be presented. Actually, my co-chair is the one making the formal presentation to the ACD. So if you're interested in that, I, I would encourage you to do it. And the reason it's relevant is it was one of the areas that was, was recognized by the working group as an example of something that, that, that NLM should play a larger role in, um, in providing intellectual and programmatic leadership recognizing that this is something that is of relevance to not only the precision medicine issue, but many of the things going on at many of the institutes, and yet it does slip between the cracks. So this is not a solution, and what's going to happen is they'll, now we're going to be a search for a new director, and they have the working group report as a blueprint for going forward. Obviously, this won't change overnight, It'll probably take several years, but I do believe that this is an area that is now going to be recognized as being important for NLM to show leadership on, and so within a few years, one might imagine having a more locus, a, a clear locus of expertise. On an interim level, I think sort of the big data to knowledge, the associate director for data sciences office is sort of in this area, but, you know, I, and I, I don't know off the top of my head, maybe somebody around here does, whether any of the, the funded programs under BD2K hit this head on. But again, any of that I think is going to be interim to where I think it's going to likely be much more uh, looked at by the NLM over the long run. Thank you. Aaron, did you have other points also? Oh, the only, the last thing I was going to say is, as well, we've gotten pretty far in, in ClinGen, for example, and, and some of the other programs in developing the pipeline for pulling in data from ClinVar and then doing the additional annotation and interpretation of validity, pathogenicity, and, and, and actionability. Um, but, and then, to, you know, we're working on getting that out then and making it available through some of the work that Mark's doing to um, EHR systems, but we haven't figured out sort of the, the best approaches for pulling the outcomes data, like you alluded to, and then bringing that back into the system to uh, improve and iterate on the interpretations that we've already made. And I think that's a barrier that we do need to spend more time thinking about. Well, I think the, e the EHR group within ClinGen, you know, is, is a quite an active group. And so I think there'll be some opportunities there to look at transportability and, 
you know, building again, building a tool, and how do we get it into the various places? So um, maybe um, we'll we'll come back to you after that. So, Stephen or Mike? Um, I think uh, on your first slide you made a very provocative point. Um, what NHGRI is doing in this genomic medicine effort is uh, fundamentally uh, somewhat different than anything I've experienced before in terms of changing the practice of medicine. Um, and the genomes are really the first place where medicine, the old system of practicing medicine, becomes broken irrevocably and where physicians, as you pointed out, can't compute, uh, can't cope with the computational needs. Um, that at a very high level, you know, um, is revolutionary. And so how do we deal with that? Uh, we're essentially going against the grain of routine medical practice. And so how do we win over physicians and persuade them that it's in their best interest to let go? when all of their training has been about not letting go. In fact, doing things repetitively to the point that they can do it in their sleep. Um, so there's a fundamental issue there that's gonna to be tough in terms of practical implementation of genomic medicine. Um, there seem to be two you know, sort of ways of doing that. One is to win physicians over, but the other is to build essentially an automated delivery system for genomic medicine. And I think that's inevitable. I don't think we can retrain medicine to cope with genomes. And so um, sort of the overarching theme here is uh, building a system that delivers somewhat automated genomic medicine. And it starts with uh, obtaining phenotypes by natural language processing to computing which patients are gonna benefit from testing, to then running the testing and automatically interpreting it, and then turning that into clinical practice guidelines and alerts that go back to physicians. Um, and it's almost autonomous. And so there's elements of that that I don't think we've talked about, but I do think at a high level, you know, there has to be some consideration about, um, is this the right way to go? Um, are there alternative approaches? and how do we engage uh, physicians, physician leadership, medical school deans, all those sorts of folks, um, and have them participate in this dialogue about recreating uh, uh, genomic medicine. Yeah, thank, thank you. And, and I, don't, I don't think that this is a revolution. You know, this isn't the fenestration of Prague or something. I mean, this is more the British invasion in terms of the Beatles, where, you know, the kids are won over and then pretty soon the adults are humming along too. Uh, and, and, uh, and so I, I think that, you know, the, your, your strategy uh, of, of you, know, when, you know, certainly many of us are, are at our centers are trying to figure out how do we do this so it can be delivered in a way where people almost don't even know what's happening so that they can use it in practice and not have to think they have to retrain or whatever. So I think that's, that's great. Uh, Mike, before we go open more Yes, I, I, I think that's a, it is an excellent point that, um, you know, a lo historically medicine was done. We did the computations in our head and we got some data from these clunky billing systems. But, but now this, some of the computation that has to happen, they, yeah. we need to assist the, the practitioner. But just, just um, a couple of points about the EHR problem at large, and then what parts of it I think we should try to focus our attention on. So that, I mean, there are many people working on various aspects of the EHR problems. One is the interoperability for clinical purposes, but that's a different problem I think we might be trying to solve. There, there, you, you want a doctor sitting in Ohio to be able to see the data, the same data that, that was when the patient was admitted with pneumonia in Florida in, in February. Um, and that's, a, that's one flavor of the problem, that kind of interoperability of, the, of systems talking to each other. Um, and what, what we're trying to do and where I think we should play a, a bigger role is that is some level of curation of that data. And I do believe that, to, to echo Dan and Chris, that um, that's a major investment in mapping the human phenome for our purposes, for our particular purposes, to understand the relationships between omics and, and phenomics is, is well worth it. E each um, EHR, and within a quote single EHR like the VA, 
um, they're very, there are very unique aspects um, to those environments. And so I don't think um, we can underestimate the importance of what you had said and what Emerge has done is taking experts within those systems. I think that some people have this misconception that you can just take data from lots of EHRs, dump it into some central place, um, and then that makes, that, that, and then, then that's quite usable. And I think there's a lot of reasons why um, that, that, that we need to rethink that, that, that particular construct. And the, then the curation of the phenotypes um, in ways that we've never thought of before. It's not just the simple grabbing of the ICD, because the ICD might be wrong. I mean, the codes that were made for billing, you know, we have done, you know, ha we've had some successes in common variant issues, but in a lot of cases, um, we've grabbed low-hanging fruit. We tried to do neuroleptic malignant syndrome as a, as a phenotype, and we just decided we couldn't. There was just no way. You know, it was a, it was a diagnosis of exclusion, and, it, and, the, and the diagnoses were so circular. We just couldn't get to the, the phenotype. There are there codes for it. It's just that they're, 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 you look at the charts. We couldn't come up with a, a gold standard from a clinician. The other thing is what we're doing is we're, we are gold standarding 95% certainty to a clinician's perspective. The clinicians are looking at, at the chart and says, yeah, he's got the disease. Well, what if the disease is a syndrome that's actually 20 different physiologic entities? We've created an algorithm to something that's, that, so we need, I think, to, to begin to re, really rethink the, the field in general. And I think that this, the, the, the purpose that we're mapping Interoperability is different for different purposes. A clinician wants to see just the exact same data that the other hospital has. What, what we need to do when we're talking about interoperability is making sure we're talking the same language from a biologic perspective. So I think that you know, NHGRI could help in helping to define the process, and I think the collect, any collection of bright people trying to solve the same problem could create s some standards in, the, in setting the process. Yeah. Um, perhaps something like Emerge has done, but on a, on a grander scale of creating libraries of, you know, of curated algorithms or of solutions to some of these um, problems that are potentially accessible um, by, by others who are doing genomic or non-genomic um, research from, from that sort of biologic perspective. So I, I, I do want to just, um, you know, reiterate the, the need for, um, I think, investment in this area about mm -hmm. thinking about how we get lots of these different systems to talk to each other as we're trying to compile larger and larger um, uh, resources, um, and they, with PMI as being a very good example. But I think that NHGRI can, can do an awful lot in this space. Yeah, and is. Uh, and is. Uh, yeah. And I think one you know, one of the things we, we talked a fair amount last night about uh, we we're uh, we're excited about trying to engage more with Canada and and and, and this is one of those areas there's a, among many where there's a commonality of, of the issues and as we're looking at transportability across EHRs I mean you have your you know each of your centers has EHRs each of our centers you know there's there's things like that that we could look at at a at a grander level to try to solve the, you know try to work on the genomic component and. I think there's some, some good opportunities there. Um, Mark, I know you had your hand up, and then there was a bunch of others. I think Heather maybe second, so was it Mark? Yeah, so two things related to the points that were brought up. One, just a brief reiteration that in the training space, um, ACMG and the American Medical Informatics Association is exploring um, training opportunities uh, related to uh, the Clinical Informatics Fellowship and uh, Genomics, um, and I'm leading that group along with uh, uh, Bob is involved uh, as one of the past chair of the Genomic Medicine uh, uh, and Translational um, uh, Working Group of AMIA, uh, along with Jesse Tenenbaum from Duke. Um, one of the things that we need to follow up on is to see in the NLM space what the training they are doing and whether there would be some opportunities to partner uh, with them and develop uh, something, but we'd also be looking for potential funding opportunities there. Um, the second thing relating to the electronic health record, you know, you uh, mentioned that, you know, one of the things within the ClinGen space is, that we're looking at is, you know, information movement uh, back and forth. I would have to say that for the first 
for, for this uh, uh, grant, what we're really looking for is more access to the ClinGen resource as opposed to yeah. um, uh, actually having clinicians put information into the um, a ClinGen resource through the EHR. Ultimately, we want to be able to get there, um, but I think that that's not something that is envisioned within uh, the first uh, round of funding for uh, for that. But uh, again, if we have a vision that that's where we want to go, then what, what we can begin to instantiate within the uh, connection uh, is uh, the, uh, using the standards that we know would allow that going forward. Thank you. Heather? So I just wanted to mention briefly that we do have a couple training opportunities within extramural at NHGRI. We offer the KO1 and the KO8. These are mentored scientist opportunities. For the KO1, we focus on genomic science. So if there's a biologist or an engineer who wants to train in informatics or technology development, they would be eligible to apply for this to get that cross-training. Similarly, for the KO8s, we're looking for MDs or PhDs who want to receive cross-training again in informatics along the lines of electronic health records, um, technology development, and really being able to push this implementation of genomic medicine into the clinic. So these are new areas for NHGRI, but we have those two opportunities as well. And then stepping back, we also support several pre-doc and post-doc fellowships within the realms of genomic medicine and genomic science. And we also have a new genomic medicine T32. These are institutional training grants. These, for the T32 for genomic medicine, is limited to postdocs only. We're looking at supporting somewhere between four to six trainees over a five-year period to be able to really immerse them into an institutional training program where they receive didactic coursework, they have mentorship, and they really start to understand how to put this into the clinical workflow. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to come back to the points that Stephen and then Mike made a little while ago, and I think it's, it's a central uh, issue that needs to be addressed. One is, as I also mentioned yesterday, the focus on the provider and where the provider uh, and the doctors uh, you, you know, are, are overwhelmed with the demands of genomic medicine and need help, and hence sort of the idea of, uh, well, how can we create an automated tool and a tool that can automate the process of injecting genomic information into the decision making process i think is an essential one and i would also uh, want to add to that that looking at the ehr providers for this uh, may be um, a, a bit of a, a frustrating experience and has been to some extent already and and hence the conclusion would be in my mind to think about seriously how can we actually push and incentivize the development of systems that take on this task of automating genomic medicine, but live outside of EHR. And essentially, all they have to do is interact in real time with EHR. And all the EHR solutions that I'm aware of really have the capability of plug in and, and play. And so I think one important aspect of this particular conversation can be to think about, you know, in a concrete way about promoting efforts to come to automated systems to enable genomic medicine, um, uh, you know, to support physicians who are overwhelmed uh, and these systems to interact with EHR but not directly be EHR. Thank you. Rex and then John. So I think um, Heidi's not here, but I sort of feel obligated since it was on, on the, in the title actually to talk about the importance of us trying to figure out how to facilitate all the various clinical laboratories out there being able to submit in an easy way to uh, ClinVar. So, you know, creating maybe a plug, you know, to use your term, plug and play pipelines that um, some of the clinical laboratories connect to and thinking about the fact that we could really maximize the flow of information if we made it easier. So it seems to me that should be high on the agenda to think about how to achieve that. I'm, Heidi would have said it much more elegantly, but I, I think it's an important thing for us to be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, did you have your hand? Oh. I, he was, I guess he was holding his hand up for you. <laughs> 
Thanks, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> I wanted to uh, say a few words about the network formerly known as the HMORN, which uh, Mark has mentioned a few times. And uh, the HMORN has actually been working for about two decades on the problem of trying to extract phenotypic information from the medical record. Um, and doing this in a, in a way that allows collaboration across the 17 sites in the HMORN. And um, I think one of the challenges that the HMORN has had in um, developing collaborations with people outside of the HMORN is the lack of recognition of this area of expertise. And I don't even think that we have come up with a term at this meeting that is consistent across all the panels of what we even call this area of expertise. I call it medical informatics, but I'm not sure that's the right word. But we need a name for it. And I'm reminded of even when I was in training in biostatistics, um, that that area of expertise was not fully recognized as something that you need to have on your project. Um, and even uh, at that time, biostatisticians often wouldn't even be considered important enough to be a co-author co on a paper, but would just be in the acknowledgement section. And I think we really need to recognize what is this area of expertise, give it a name, and require it on our projects. Um, I think it exists out there, and, and there have been people working on this for a very long time, but uh, it's really under-recognized. Yeah, that's right. Bob? Yeah, I wanted to, um, as a physician, uh, I'll, I'll be uh, having practiced in uh, genetics, and my first job in genetics was in, in human genetics was in 1979, so I've been in genetics, steeped in it for a long time. But I did want to push back a little bit about the concept that um, physicians um, can't compute um, or have, will have difficulty with um, capturing genetics and genomics into their practice. I think that the key point is that it needs to be made relevant to what they're trying to do for their patients. Um, physicians, in the, the practice of medicine involves on-the-fly computation of probabilities in your head all the time. Um, that's what we do. Um, so what, what you need is the tools that assist you to do that. Um, computation, uh, physicians use computational tools uh, or computational intensive data all the time. Think about CT scan, MRI those where the computation is done, but they don't spit out an answer that says there's a brain tumor here. They spit out an image, which still requires careful uh, interpretation. Um, so I think that, that we, we need to not uh, assume that the, the providers can do everything. We also need not to assume they can't do anything. We need to provide them tools that help them do exactly what they're doing now. Yeah, that's good. Mark? Yeah. I, um what we have here is a problem in the sense that even if you take genomics off the table, the amount of data exceeds yeah. human cognitive capacity, and that's, you know, that's inarguable. And so the idea, and I think the point that was being made, perhaps not in, uh, you know, as, as uh, clear or elegantly as it could be, is that the best human can do five variables. And medicine, Every single time we see a patient involves way more than five variables. So what do we do? Well, we pick five variables, and then we make a decision. And it's why medicine operates at a half a sigma reliability. Um, so so the, the issue here is, is that we're in an era of data complexity, even without genomics, that is going to require expert systems to assist in um, consistent high quality delivery, and, um, and that means, you know, developing fully functional electronic health record systems that can really, you know, provide that synthesis um, so that we can present to the clinicians the data pieces that are most critically important for clinical decision making, and then let the clinicians use uh, judgment based on that, uh, on their patients to, with a, with a, a, a number of um, variables that they can actually deal with in a reasonable way. So gen genomics is, is adding to that problem, but it didn't create that problem. And, but we need to um, um, add to the solution, um, which is now just kind of in the early stages of how do we develop a highly reliable 
um, uh, approach to patients. And the only group in medicine that's done it is anesthesia, where they've gone to essentially airline-related checklists and other things to deliver care that's at a four sigma reliability. So this is a major issue for healthcare, and it represents the move from a craft-based um, training into a 21st century mass customization approach, which is what precision medicine, you know, is really all about. And our training programs at the present time are still essentially working off of medieval apprenticeship model. I, I agree with all of that. So I'm just wondering if we can we can kind of come back to where an HDRI might might be able to help in this in this space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounds sounds like it was obvious, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> like probably maybe yeah that's right uh, you know so it's it, the world is coming apart and it's a terrible thing um, but but hopefully there are there are places where we can work so so where we have focused in the emerge program and and maybe some of the others is in defining phenotypes not because phenotype is our business it's very much not our business but the only way to do genomic research was to define these things and nobody else was going to do it and so we did um, so we we would like to see that farmed out to our sister institutes and and you know have you take on a, a number of others that, that we just can't handle within our, our programs. But, but in addition, there's this question of how do you best integrate genomic information? How, how do you provide it in APIs or however it is that, that one does that? That seems as though that is within our remit um, and is, is something that, that we can do. And, and are we doing enough in that area? Or, you know, we're never doing enough, but, but can we do it better? Can you help us to sort of, sort of figure out, prioritize what issues really we can tackle? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm stuck on the naming problem, uh, and I, I very much liked your presentation with the 57 flavors of albumin or 3,000 flavors or however many it was. Sh shades it, of gray. There you go. <laughs> In the context of genomics, I mean, this point was raised yesterday, uh, and, and Bob and others have been working assiduously to solve it. But when I was babbling on about grammars yesterday, the way we name genomic variants is not uh, amenable to their application and use in a clinical context. Clinical decision support environments have to be able to grab a nameable entity. Uh, and so far, uh, and, and we all know that the star allele system is collapsing under its own weight. That will not serve as a framework for uh, uh, nomenclature of, of genomic variants. I think one thing that, NA, that is relevant to NHGRI's remit is how do we go about consistently and comparably naming, identifying genomic variants so that they can be inserted into the clinical process in a consistent and reliable way. Until we have that, it's sort of left as an exercise for each organization to solve. Uh, it goes back to the old dreaded laboratory test naming problem. Why every laboratory in the country feels they have a, you know, an inborn right to uh, come up with their own darn names when perfectly good link names exist. We're seeing that phenomenon again on the genomic side. And it might be timely to nip that one in the bud with a concerted effort of just nomenclature associated with genomic variation. So just so just to, to address that, aren't there groups, aren't there HL7 groups and others that are, that are tackling this? And Jonathan, maybe you're familiar with them or, or Chris? So I, I, I'm not familiar with the HL7 group, but I just wanted to put in a plug for the ClinGen data model working group, which basically has spent the last probably six months really fleshing out a, an allele model, right, to describe exactly what you're saying. Um, the, the very particular definition of what an allele is and how you represent it so that you can have essentially a standardized naming system for every variant that's possible. Um, and so that is something that, that ClinGen is working on and, and trying to harmonize with the GA, uh, for GA4GH and other sort of uh, groups that are doing that. I would urge you to harmonize also with the clinical space yes. because, as I said yesterday, you know, for, for reasons that are obscure to me, although I'm guilty, academics feel they have a blank sheet of paper and that there's no real world out there uh, and that we can, uh, the fact that you're not familiar with the HL7 activity in this area is actually somewhat um, so, uh, yeah. disturbing. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not running that data model group, but I, 
Um, they, they're they're actually discussing f fire and other systematic uh, terminologies. I was just going to add, they do have representatives like Sandy Aronson that are actively engaged in um, HL7 yeah. and working um, with the I IOM, I guess it's the digitize program now. So we're trying to make as many links as we can, but the point you, uh, you raised about having the, the clinical perspective, we were discussing that at our, clear, at our steering committee meeting and we recognize and we are trying to bring in um, folks like Heidi and others that are sitting on, on that group, but it's, it's a good point. Yeah, I would like to get back to what Chris uh, initiated here in terms of the conversation about uh, standards and terminology uh, with regard to variants and alleles. And, and uh, while I, I absolutely agree that it's very critical and that you know groups need to work on that, and I'm glad to hear that this is happening, I don't believe that this is uh, sort of the essential uh, um, task. Uh, to deliver the in genomic information in the clinical practice. I think that uh, this gets us to the last mile, but the last mile to make it useful for physicians and for us all to achieve the outcomes that we hope to achieve with this so that the physician takes the right decision and acts with genome information. The last mile needs to be a translation of alleles into what it means for the care of the patient in front of the physician. I think the physicians are not going to act on us telling them about alleles. We need to actually translate what it means in terms of risk or in terms of prescribing practice um, in, in, uh, for, the, uh, for the patient. Uh, and so I think there's a translation tool that's needed rather than a convention a nomenclature tool. And I, I, I actually think this is something that we can uh, summarize under going the last mile into practice, which takes it from all the conventions and nomenclatures and translates it so that the physician is comfortable with using the information. But I think, I think the, you know, part of our goal needs to be to make uh, genomics less special um, at the clinical level. Uh, because it, it, and from, a, you know, from a practitioner standpoint, it's genetics information is not that different from all the other types of information that are coming in. You know, we think it's special, and, and there definitely are nuances that we need to solve. But the, the final piece, um, you know, often we try to make it more special from a job security standpoint, but I think our goal needs to be the, the opposite. I think Bob, and, or do you have a point to directly on that one? Or? So and, then, more, and then Bob Freeman. Yeah, so more related to the sort of physicians um, using the genomic information, we've had some recent progress from the CSER and Emerge Consortia who have recently um, co-authored a paper regarding sources of heterogeneity in the, in the EHR related to genomic information and how it's stored. And that paper really highlights the um, the sources of variability that, that um, come into the EMR related to cl uh, various clinical labs, um, submitting genomic information and clinicians' notes, and just how heterogeneous all of that information really is and how hard it is to standardize across various categories of information. So I think we're starting to define the gaps and the opportunities that that paper is impressed at Jamia, I believe. So I, I think we've, we've had a little bit of progress in that area, and it, I think, directly speaks to the, the continued needs to, to do additional work in this area. Great. Uh, Bob? Thank you. Just to clarify, the ClinGen project is actually quite tightly aligned with what's going on in HL7 and the IOM Action Collaborative uh, Digitize. Uh, Larry Babb and Sandy Aronson have done an incredible job of reaching out to all the groups that play in this space and try to align what's going on in ClinGen with these other efforts. And so that there is, it, it is true that it's a bit like herding cats, but at least they're on the job and, and uh, achieving some success. Um, on the topic of genetic nomenclature, uh, you know, e each one of the systems that are in current use today were designed for a particular purpose. They're fit for that purpose. And uh, that means by extension that uh, there is no one right tool for the job. Uh, what a computer needs and what, a, what the EHR system would work best using is not what a clinician wants to see in front of them as they're caring for a patient and vice versa. And so we shouldn't try to use one nomenclature that was designed for human readability to shove it into the EHR and, and pretend the EHR is going to be able to compute on it. So there are different systems that are needed. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that each system uh, that is required is fit for the purpose that it is intended to, uh, to be used for and does that job well. 
and then don't try to necessarily have a square peg round hole problem and reuse that same system someplace else where it wouldn't necessarily be as good of a natural fit. Then, of course, we do need trans very robust translation systems that will allow us to translate one of these uh, naming schemes into another so that we can cross that bridge between humans and computers. Thanks. And many of us survived the, uh, the, the change in liver uh, test from SGOT to AST. Uh, we, it took us a while to change the way we said it, but we did survive, and we still knew how to use it and all that kind of stuff. So we can go from star nomenclature to something else or whatever it needs to be. So it can happen. Um, I think Katrina and then Rex. Um, I wanted to um, mention the point that I think a lot of our consortiums uh, that are here today are really focused more on the discovery and identification of people um, who carry of risk alleles, but we need to think a little bit further beyond that, and the job is not done when uh, we've identified people and given them a diagnosis, and we actually need to think about management of populations, and that's actually made really difficult by the fact that there are not specific diagnosis codes for most of the genetic conditions, not even for something as common as Lynch syndrome. Um, is there a specific diagnosis code? And it's really hard to find uh, people after they've received that diagnosis and it's in their EMR because they're mixed in with so many other diagnoses that it makes the problem of managing that population very difficult. Um, so I think that's another area where we need some work on standardization. It's in, even in ICD-10, there's not a code for Lynch syndrome. I think in an issue, I can have a role in, in the genomics part of that. So uh, I think that is something that some of it, I don't think there necessarily is money in this particular case. It's more uh, trying to put focus and pressure on, on some of these larger initiatives to, to pay attention to the genomics portion. And I think even the EHR, if you look at the EHR vendors, uh, there, there was a, a, little, a little bit of a turning point when they were kind of brought together with one of the, the previous meetings for uh, GM5 or whatever it was with, when they were each. HR vendors were there, and they're like, okay, I guess somebody does care about this, maybe we should pay attention. And then now the market is, is causing those changes, so it's good. Uh, Rex? Yeah, I just want to emphasize something you said, Howard, and, and I, I know that uh, Emerge is paying a lot of attention to this in the EHR working group, and I assume the interaction between Emerge and Caesar uh, probably is doing the same. And that is just the simple fact of putting a genetic variant into the electronic health record as a lab value. And that seems to be, I think, making good progress. And simply by doing that, then you create it in, in the health record in a way that it becomes a computable entity that, as I talked about yesterday, yeah. you can merge with a knowledge base, such as ClinGen, to actually produce clinical decision support that can then fire, just as we do for any lab value in the EHR. Yeah, I, I think we've all lived through um trying to hunt down the PDF that w was uploaded someplace in the HR and has the genomic data and, you know, it's, it's a phenomenal way to, to hide information. I mean, you know, NSA can't even find it, so anyway. Yeah, I would just want to come back to the vendor, um, and this is something that Aaron and I have um, talked a little bit about. Um, I think that the, there are real key, we've talked about, you know, making sure that we're connected in with all the different standard organizations and are using that, but uh, there's uh, also some, um, some utility in having the vendors engaged to understand what the end game is here. Um, I was, we were meeting with one of the major vendors a couple of days ago, and it was interesting to me that when we were talking about some of the strategies that we were using, like info buttons and this sort of thing, well, we think info buttons are a dead end, we're going this direction, but, you know, that they're in meaningful use, and uh, so there's some push-pull uh, within the vendor community in terms of what they're doing, and the same thing goes for um, uh, HL7, where they're saying, well, we think HL7 is going to uh, not be the way to go on this, and so uh, the the crux then is, well, what's the rules for engagement? So if, if we'd like to have vendors involved in the EHR section of ClinGen, because we're, we have an interoperability uh, goal there, um, under what circumstances can we involve them? Do we have to have all of the vendors there, some of the vendors? Could we do it with if there's only one vendor interested? Uh, and so that's more of, uh, it's not an interesting research question at all. Uh, but it's something that's a logistical issue that uh, we need some guidance on from 
uh, how we can actually effectively engage and, and utilize the resources that are available. Uh, you know, IOM has the, um, the space to be able to operate in that type of a thing, but that's, it's not as clear that that can be done uh, within the context of a uh, NHGRI grant or cooperative agreement. Other points. So, so Howard, did we did we get that sort of crystallization of uh, of the things that NHGRI can do or should do in, I, in this area? We've I, heard what it shouldn't do. It shouldn't be responsible for all of it. I, I think crystallization might be an extreme word, but um, I, I I think that there's a couple of elements that, that came out. One was uh, NHGRI advocating uh, at the at the pan NIH level to make sure that that um, attention to EHR ha the, the genomic component is is certainly part of that. I, th I think that there, from a training standpoint, I and mean, Heather mentioned some of the training opportunities, uh, maybe some of those need to be either crafted around this, this area or some, some uh, joint training with, with uh, NCBI or, or, or others um, could, be, could, you know, could be something that could come out of this. I think the, the eMERGE activities of, around transportability and such need to be broadened, and I, I think they, they will be. Uh, Certainly, interactions with the VA, with Canada, with other uh, other um, aspects are you know would would help with that. And I know a lot of that is happening, and certainly you know the you know the Air Force is, is active in there and others. So so there's you know it's broadening out beyond just Epic and Cerner. Um, but uh, I think that that's one area that can be put forward. Um, I I don't think that we that we um, wrote the start of an RFA, nor would we ask to, nor would we want to exclude ourselves from applying by doing that. Um, so, you know, we didn't give you that part. Um, but um, those are at least some of the things that came out of it. And hopefully during the exchanges uh, after the meeting, we can enhance that even more. Stephen? Yeah, just to add uh, one thing. Um, I think what we've identified is a need for additional software development, um, that there are gaps in terms of uh, the software pieces and that it's unlikely that without uh, NHGRI involvement that they will soon be uh, filled uh, and that that would be a place where there has been a historical precedent for investments that have been transformative, say, in, in just genome analysis. And now we need to, uh, I think, migrate that out a little bit in terms of um, patient identification, uh, clinical decision support, uh, helping to make um, the entire organism more usable by uh, physicians and other healthcare providers, I think, uh, would be huge. And I might also ask, we, we've talked a lot about the electronic health record aspects of this. We haven't talked much about clinical workflow, um, and, and it seems as though that is maybe not as, as big a barrier, but, but at least is a, is a barrier in some places to, to being sure that we have turnaround and a, and a rapid enough um, uh, pace. And Stephen, obviously, you've done, you know, fabulous work in, in that area with, uh, with the, the NICU. So, so are, there, are there issues that we need to address there, or are, are we kind of confident that that's moving along at its own pace? Clinical workflow is always local, and so, yes. is, and so I think the issue there is, uh, I, I, uh, you know, the point that was made, uh, I think, by um, Rex on uh, Heidi's behalf, that the laboratory workflow in terms of getting information into ClinVar is uh, probably something that's more amenable to a generalizable solution, but the clinician uh, workflow, I think the point of emphasis needs to be more on having the tools available um, that would allow the potential for uh, deposition, but uh, I don't think there's a way to really um, uh, research a generalizable uh, uh, solution for the clinician workflow entry. So I would uh, tend to de-emphasize that as an area of priority for research. Bob and then Jeff. I'm just going to sort of second that as well, and I think that the, the focus for clinical workflow should be on uh, on the kinds of tools that help. Um, uh, 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 manage the the data in um, thinking about timing. I mean, the, the the besides you know the income from practicing medicine, the second most valuable thing to providers is their time, and so the the kinds of efforts that you have to go through now to uh, put together a case and figure out what testing needs to be done, interpret it, and and deliver that to the patients and so forth is a lot of time, and that's a huge area where clinical workflow can be improved.
I think uh, one thing that's new about genomic medicine is that it's pulling genome data into uh, users who um, traditionally weren't involved in it, and they don't necessarily have the informatics support uh, of a powerhouse genome center. And uh, the software universe is very, very fragmented at present, and so we wind up spending months. I mean, just if I think about our insight teams and how some of them spent months and months uh, collating, collecting, comparing the various bits and pieces that they needed to put together to build a, a workflow or a pipeline. I think uh, a, a lot could be done to help that that would assist a, an awful lot of new entrants into this area to get up to speed. Jeff and then Irwin. So a lot of what, we're, what we've been talking about um, in this section uh, has huge economic implications for the electronic health record business community. So I wonder um, if uh, there's a, a, a research stream here that can actually be done, uh, and I don't know if this is NHGRI, but, but that could build the business case as to why the vendors really should be paying attention to this area so that um, uh, it engages them in, in why it's better for their business to, um, to move in this direction as opposed to uh, having it sort of pushed on them uh, from a very engaged and um, uh, important research community. So, there, so I just want to throw out the, the notion that an economic model for the incorporation of genetic and genomic information into the EHR uh, could be a topic for, um, for research and investigation, just as the director's office is broadly uh, engaged in the economic model for personalized health care. Um, this is, should be at least a, a component of that. Yeah, uh, glad you mentioned that, Jeff, because I have a different opinion. <laughs> and that is, uh, if I may, uh, we have a lot of experience with working with one of, or some of the big vendors. And, uh, and I think we all in eMERGE and uh, outside of eMERGE have made the experience that the EHR vendor community is focused on satisfying uh, and, and responding to very different pressures. And I think, um, y you know, we don't necessarily, as a matter of approach, to get genomic information into uh, uh, the EHR or at the fingertips of the clinician, need to have solutions that come from within the EHR community. The EHR systems, by and large, are interoperable. And as was mentioned, I think, uh, focus uh, on uh, developing uh, tools that specifically interact with the HR and translate the message just as well as if the message was generated within the HR should be the focus, in my view, uh, for a more speedy delivery of uh, genome-informed CDS rather than uh, trying to engage the vendor community again to that cause. Can I just reinforce what Erin said? Um, you know, at Emerge, we've had uh, at least one experience in sort of in the broader Emerge Caesar community, I think even a second experience at actually bringing in the HR vendors. And they, they really are sort of waiting for us to tell them how to do it. it it's, it's pretty clear. And um, the, the second piece, in, I, I couldn't agree more about the need to make the economic case, but before we're going to need to make the economic case, we've got the bigger problem to solve of how do the payers actually going to pay for doing this. And I, I think it sort of becomes the second or third step away problem that's just, I, I think we need to get some of the more proximal ones solved first. It's a real problem, but I just don't know how we tackle it, at least not at the NHGRI level. Well, this has been very, very useful. Um, sure. to, 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 Let's see if there's any other. Yeah, any uh, what? Chris, Chris looked like he was about to. No, oh, right. No, okay. All right. Uh, so, Terry and I, look, from a time standpoint, we, we still have plenty of time. We, we're not planning on going over our appointed time. Um, but we will move the break up to right now. We'll, we'll go to a 20-minute break. Um, and then we'll start off with uh, Mary and the rest of her team in, in uh, panel eight at that point. So, if we could be back here at, at uh, 1040. Sorry, 1039. <laughs>